D N T show is intended for mature audiences. Parental discretion is advice. Live long and prosper, bitches. Friends with benefits. <laughs> Speaking of having a good time, Terry. Mm-hmm. Dayton broke <laughs> the G and T show. This is now the David Mac <laughs> appreciation <laughs> hour. You assholes. <laughs> <laughs> what is it about this guy that people love him so much with his purple velvet cape and his crown? I thought it was a little much when he had us carry him in the studio on a throne. I am awesome. <laughs> Look what I have done! Look what I have brought upon the world! There is an urge to go yin 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 yin. I heard rumors that you might be working on something else, but we won't pry much. <laughs> I'm gonna say it. I'm gonna pry a little. <laughs> dare you! How dare you ask me to change it? Do you not understand the majesty of my genius? <laughs> and the guy sitting next to me looked at me like he was, you know, like I'd cramped in his hat. Yeah, it's the professionalism yeah. that sells the show. That's right. And welcome to our GNT Supplemental Log. I am, of course, Gettysburg 7, your Rihansu in charge. And there she is in her finest, uh, I, I can't tell what she's wearing today. It's either her Andorian cosplay or she's just not feeling well. Terry Lynn. <laughs> Hello, everyone. <laughs> and, of course, our resident stinky Klingon, Mike. Hey, kapla. Who are you calling stinky? <laughs> Well, Klingons. Rock Peters said it, not me. Uh, one of these days, my friend. <laughs> and it is our joy to welcome to this supplemental episode, Mr. Alec Peters, who's working on Star Trek Axanar. Thank you. Thank you for having me. We are very excited. Um, as you may or, or, or may not know, the, the G&T show, what we get to do is we get to talk about uh, all kinds of forms of Star Trek storytelling. And we always love to support what we call the unofficial productions. I think the, the term fan made just doesn't quite capture <laughs> what it yeah. is that what it is that that's out there. So why don't we just start off with the big major question because there's a lot of people who don't know what is Axanar. So uh, our film Star Trek Axanar, which will be a, a feature a feature length, will be about 90 minutes. It's it's not a series. Um, it is about Garth of Isar, the captain we see in the third season Star Trek uh, TOS episode, whom gods destroy, and um, I. I was always fascinated by that character and wanted to know his backstory. And so, um, and I, I, and we finally are, are, are doing something about it and bringing the story of Garth of Isar when he was, what made him the legend that um, was Kirk's hero at the Academy. Um, as, and we, we don't know a lot about Garth from that episode, but we do know s- several things. Um, he was Garth, he was Kirk's hero. He was a role model for an entire generation of Starfleet captains. He won a battle at the battle called the Battle of Axnar that had some profound effect on the Federation. And, um, and, uh, uh, and and that's and and his and his uh, book is required reading at the academy. That's about all we know. And so from that, um, I basically extrapolated the story of uh, the Battle of Axnar and Garth and his role in it. And it takes place 20 years before, uh, well, 21 years exactly before the first season of, of TOS. So it also takes place therefore 10 years before the Cage um, in the year 2245. Um, now we set. I, I'm as big a Star Trek as anyone. If you start talking, you know, <laughs> timelines and 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 all the the nitpicking stuff, uh, I you know I can wrestle anyone to the ground with that, <laughs> um, and which I do every day on our Facebook page. It seems as <laughs> I keep getting the same questions. Um, so so we set it in that year for a couple reasons. Um, one of which was that's also the year the Enterprise is launched, and we wanted to tell a story of this war with the Klingons. I mean, we we know for so long that there have been hostilities, that there was this Cold War, um, and we know that war breaks out very briefly in. In Errand of Mercy. Um, so we look back, and, and I was a big fan of the FASA role-playing games back in the 
1970s. And I took that idea of this this war with the Klingons, which they call the Four Years' War. And we allude to that. We're in the fourth year of the war with the Klingons. And it's the year that the war ends. And so what was Garth's role? And, and what was the Battle of Axanar? And who were we fighting? Obviously, the, we say it's the Klingons. And, and, and we touch on a few of the major characters of the era, including Robert April, the first captain of the Enterprise, who in Axanar is Garth's mentor and close friend. Um, huh. Interesting. Yeah. Um, now, Gar, when we first encounter Gar um, in in, uh, in TOS, he's in a, a sane asylum, isn't he? Yeah, he's a, he's one of the, I think it's the sixth last incurably insane people in the galaxy. Catwoman, <laughs> Catwoman's in there, if I remember correctly. Uh, <laughs> yes, Von Craig is... Yes. is for the, I'm, I'm sorry, Batgirl. She Batgirl, was Batgirl. Batgirl, not Catwoman. Yeah, right, Batgirl. Von Craig. Um, yeah, and um, so there's, they tell you a little bit, there's an accident, and um, the Antosians take Garth in and teach him cellular metamorphosis to heal his wounds. Um, they're, a rape, they're a race of shapeshifters. So they um, they teach him this, and unfortunately, that process makes him go mad. And by the end of the episode, they you know they had brought the Enterprise crew had brought medicine to cure to cure these people. And at the end of the episode, the medicine's been administered, and we start start to see Garth as he was really. And he hits me as really noble. And 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 that, those last few minutes of that episode, I must have watched a thousand times. And I keep saying, oh my god, I want to know more about this guy. And um, and so three years and in ago, the best traditions of fan production. Event, yeah, in the best position, and, and it, it touches on another fan production. Um, three years ago, uh, as some people know, I had a company called Propworks, which was, um, and I am a big collector of Star Trek props and costumes. Um, and I write a blog, StarTrekProps.com, which is the, you know, like the number one authority on Star Trek props and costumes. And um, I was talking to James Cawley, who many of you know as the, as, as Kirk, two. Star Trek Phase mm-hmm. 2, the creative Star Trek Phase 2, which just celebrated its 10th anniversary. And, Congratulations. Uh, to them. Yes, a big feat. They are the granddaddy of them all. Yeah, no kidding. And uh, I was talking to James because uh, I often would talk to James about costumes because he is a, a real authority on TOS. Co- he is the authority on TOS costumes. He knows them better than anyone. And at one point, he was an assistant to Bill Tice, the costume designer. So we were talking about something, and I said, um, by the way, James, I just got the original costume of Garth of Isar. It was one of my holy grails. And, um, and, and he was like, oh my god, that's so cool. And we started talking about Garth, and what a shame it was they never explored that character and and he and James says to me well you know we're shooting an episode of phase two called origins which is about about Kirk at the academy and he said and obviously that's the time that Garth was around and, and he said we should write him into the episode and I said you absolutely should write him and I see I said that would be really cool and then James says well you got to come play him then and uh I was like oh that's really cool <laughs> okay um so I did unfortunately that episode has not been released yet but you can check out the snippet um on the the uh, XR phase Facebook page. And um, basically in that little, I, I think I have two lines, but it's basically Garth and an admiral watching young Kirk blow up the Kobayashi Maru. And, ah! <laughs> and the admiral thinks that Kirk's going to wash out. He's just like, oh God, this kid. And Garth is like, oh, I like this kid. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, and uh, and so that's like the little vignette of, of it. And so while I was filming this, James um, said to me, you need to, write, you need to write this episode and you need to produce it. And that got me started. Um, and so I did and, and it's been a process of, it, to write the script, um, which is now in its third revision and now uh, the director of Action Art is right, rewriting with me and about, we've slowly been gaining steam over the past two years. Um, I was going to say, because I know that you've been working on this for well over a year and a half. So yes. when did this whole thing really begin? 2011? So Well, 2010 is when Jane pitched me to do wow. it. And then I started working with uh, John Kelly, who uh, plays Dr. McCoy, who's mm-hmm. a, a very a good amateur writer um, and uh, we attended a, a Robert McKee seminar together which really helped me uh, I'm a pretty good writer but it really helped me understand screenplays and um, so I, it, I haven't been in a rush I've been trying to do it the right way so we've slowly been gaining things and then um, le- early this year I approached Richard Hatch who you all know from Battlestar Galactica and uh, who was my mm-hmm. first acting coach 20 years ago oh that's awesome and I said uh, I told him about Axar I said Richard I want you to play Karn the lead Klingon um, and Richard being the most one of the most amazing human beings I know uh, 
was thrilled and said, absolutely, Alec. Um, he said, I'll, you know, he and I have, have been friends ever since I took that class and uh, he signed on. And that um, was awesome. And then uh, we sl- then Christian, my good friend who uh, uh, wrote and created the comic book, The Red Star, which you may or may not know, which is very well regarded in Hollywood circles. It's been optioned by Warner um, and it's in, in development there. Um, Christian has uh, fans such as James Cameron and Ridley Scott who, ha- who love his, his work. And uh, James Cameron told Christian he needed to direct. So um, Christian started directing and he's directing Axnar. He's brilliant and we're best friends so it makes it all the better. And we've slowly been adding um, really amazing people to the Axnar crew. Uh, we've recently got um, J.G. Hertzler and Gary Graham on board. Oh, fantastic. J.G. will be playing a Starfleet uh, Squadron ca- uh, Commander, Starfleet, ca- Starfleet Captain and a Squadron Commander. Um, I didn't want to see him Interesting. As I, I've seen him as a Klingon. I don't want to see him as a Klingon again. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and we have a great, really meaty role for him. Uh, it's small, but it's, it's right up his alley. Uh, Gary Graham is reprising his role as Saval. Wonderful. Oh, that's very cool. And uh, Saval is at oh, the end. It's 80 years after um, Enterprise, so uh, Saval is at the end of his career, and he's passing the reins over to Sarek. Oh, wait so, a minute. I have a, I have a question about that. Sure. Saval died. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. Someone else said that. No, he Saval died in Enterprise when they blew up the embassy. No, no he, he didn't. didn't. He survived. Oh, that was Admiral survived. Forrest. It was, it was the Admiral yeah, who died. Forrest, Forrest okay. who died. My bad. They were together. Okay, my bad. My bad. Forrest saved him. Yeah, yeah. Right. That's Okay. Wow. See, I just had a see? time displacement. You're fine. Yeah, that's right. That's okay. right. Yeah. 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 See, you, you, you don't arm wrestle me over Star Trek trivia. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I love Saval, so that's why I was like... I, okay. As a matter of fact, but, you know, over, um, I went back and watched those three episodes, which are um, The Forge, uh, I think it's a for- the, the Forge, Awakening, and Kishara. It's a, a three-episode arc, and that starts off, you're, you are right in that starts off that three-episode arc, and you have got to watch that again. It is, Gary is amazing, and Saval is amazing, and, and, and Vaughn Armstrong plays Admiral Forrest. That one scene sets up Saval and Enterprise. I, I'm sorry, Saval and Axanar, because oh, you really see at that point, you see the turn in Saval, going from that arrogant pain in the ass in, in Broken Bow to mm-hmm. the, the, the Vulcan who believes in Earth. And um, it's it, and, I, and I told Gary, I That's said, a Gary, powerful re- moment. rewatch these three episodes. You are amazing in these three episodes, and it tells you everything you will need to know about Saval and Axanar. Um, so, uh, so we're pretty excited about that, and um, I'll say it here first, we have tentative yeses from Michael uh, Hogan, who plays uh, who played um, uh, oh, Colonel Colonel Ty in yeah. South Galactica, and um, you'll be I think you'll be excited to know that he will be playing Robert April. Oh, fantastic! And um, and then we have Tony Todd, who you know as Kerr, <gasps> and older <laughs> Jake Cisco nice. and the Visitor, which the one Star Trek episode that should make all grown men cry. It should. And, uh, it does, mm-hmm. I think. And he will be playing Admiral Ramirez, um, which we're really excited about. He's the he's this he's that this guy in charge at Starfleet and uh, I wanted someone um, one of the things we're doing and it's great because JG had the same feeling about this um, is all our captains are badasses <laughs> <laughs> there are no Captain Styles or JTS Bonds or uh, or John Harriman's in Axonar. Um this is the fourth year of a war and all those guys are dead um, so <laughs> <laughs> you look at world. I mean, you, if you look at World War II, who's fighting the big battle? Patton, Bradley, it, you know, it, you know, Halsey. It, they're badasses, and uh, we're big fans of military history, and we we really want people to understand that the guys who are the captains, they're you know, Picard's not going to be a captain in the, in, the, in this film. That kind of a captain, uh, he's probably going to be the guy at the negotiating table at the peace conference. But our captains are out there to, to kill Klingon. That's what their job is to preserve right. Federation. Right. The highest. So, Really part, and Klingons. the admiral, therefore, has to be the biggest badass of them all because he's worked his way up, and um, and so we needed a present. And um, originally, I wanted Eric Avari, who you you probably know from. Oh, Star- I love him! Isn't he awesome? Oh. I want him. And then we and then my my co producer and I were talking about Tony, and I said because Tony was originally going to be a captain, and I said it makes so much more sense that he's the admiral. And he was like, "Yep, absolutely." And so when I saw Tony last week, and we pitched him, and and he's got the script now, and he's Look, reviewing. We're gonna have dinner when I. Tony, please. Uh, yes, I. He will because our co- he, he started. <laughs> he started Sushi Girl, uh, this uh, independent film that my buddy um, produced. So we feel pretty good about that. Awesome. So you see that we're trying to build a cast that's um, that uh, really strong, and Fantastic. the people that I envision would are gonna make a strong Starfleet and a strong um, a strong film. Well, let's talk a little bit about some of the effects that.
that you guys are are throwing into this. I mean, you're some of them are to, amazing. Before amazing. you do that, Terry, I've got to tell them something. Okay. When I was stationed in the 82nd Airborne, I had the pleasure of meeting uh, General Ridgeway and General Gavin before they died. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Okay, that means less impressive. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, yeah. yeah. It was it was fun. Yeah, those are those are uh, two impressive. Yeah, that's very good name dropping. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, but speaking of name dropping, when it comes to Axanar, uh, you've also drawn not just some amazing actors, but also some amazing people from the design community to yes. work on on the effects. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Well, um, sure. On the uh, design side of things, um, we have uh, Darren Docterman, um, who is involved in the uh, director's cut of Star Trek The Motion Picture, who's a huge Star Trek geek, one of the top concept artists in Hollywood. Um, he's working on a really big movie right now, who I can't t- and I can't tell you what it is, but he told me and I was like, wow, okay, that's cool. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, he and then we also have John Eves, who everyone knows, um, who designed Enterprise E and the Valdor class and the Scimitar and just about everything for the last, you know, the last 10 years of Star Trek, um, who's brilliant. Sexiest um, ship ever, the Enterprise E. Oh, I love the E. I know, because I hate the D. Sorry, fans. Mm-hmm. No, I, yeah, I'm with you. Yeah, I, I have I have two models of the E on my shelf. The model of the D is way across the room on the other side. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah the, John's brilliant. And the, the Valdor is amazing. Yeah. I mean, I always hated the Romulan Warbird, and, but the Valdor class is, is, is just, yeah. Too. It's wholly yeah. fitting for Dinatra. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I know. I love it. So, um, and then we have, you know, it's interesting. Uh, and we have a, a another concept artist, uh, Sean Toringo, who uh, h- helped create the Ares, the USS Ares Garth ship. And um, his specialty is graphic art. So when you see the wallpapers that we do, that's all Sean. And then... Yeah, we're familiar with Sean's work. We're very work. familiar with Sean's work. Awesome. Yeah, awesome. He's great. And then the new addition to the team who's just lighting it on fire is Eric Henry, who's, I think he's 21 years old. And he found out about Axnor and he starts sending me images. And there are a couple <laughs> interesting things. Like, he's like, I think this is, should be what your bridge looks like. And I think your command console should look, look like this. And I was like, huh, okay, that's kind of cool. And I, you know, I, I kind of I, at first I I got to admit I, I kind of blew him off I was like oh that's really nice thanks and I was sending him over to um to Darren Document and then but Eric wouldn't leave me alone and he kept saying oh I thought about what your pad should look like here you go I thought about what the chair captain should, yeah and he start, and I going wow that's pretty good and I'd send him off to Christian the director and he'd say oh wow and then I'd say okay Eric can you do this to it or can you do that to it and you know and so now he's in Japan right now um, studying Japanese and um, so every morning I wake up to something new from Eric Henry. Um, Oh, how fun! And that's the stuff you've been seeing this week on our page. Uh, our, you know, is uh, is all Eric and uh, uh, amazing, just uh, amazing. Where he really gets it. So, what one of the things about Axonar is we take place twenty years before, twenty one years before, where no man has gone before, ten years before the cage. So, what does that design aesthetic look like? Right. So, the biggest challenge is making it look sensible without making it look like a Buck Rogers cereal from the thirty, right? Because the cage looks very different from where No Man Has Gone Before. Very uh, true. You know, and if you keep regressing, remember that's a 1960s uh, vision of the future. So it's already almost 50 years old. So right. do you try and get yourself in that mindset and go 20 years back? Or do you basically say, okay, that, that's overall, that's what it looks like. What does it look like 20 years earlier? Now, it doesn't look like the Kelvin, right? Because the Kelvin, <laughs> the, the, while the outside of the ship makes absolute total sense, the bridge, okay, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I was okay with it. The uniform's okay. Maybe not, but uh, whatever. So we're trying to, to create something <laughs> that people look at and go, okay, that makes sense. They're at war. So the uniforms are a little more functional. So we're not wearing boots with heels, right? The girls aren't in mini skirts. We're, you know, right. we're trying to take cues, but also think, you know, what was 20 years before TOS was, well, that was World War II, you know, when they were making, you know, 20 years before when they were making Star Trek was World mm, War II. And right. 20 years earlier, more structure, right? A little right. more functional. Hey, you're in the 60s. You're more casual, more stylish. So those are the kind of design cues we've taken into Axanar. And so if you've seen some of our costume designs, they look, they're different. They're, uh, um, there's a little more structure to cer- certain aspects. The pants you'll see are more like paratrooper pants that blouse into your boot. The boots are a lot, little more chunkier and a little more functional. Um, and everything we're doing is hand, like handhold. Consoles have handholds on them because when you're being rocked around, you need to grab onto something. Things like that. Very cool. There's uh, a lot of... Uh, 
uh, of computer generated image images on 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 the Facebook page. Um, is is this going to be live action or is it going to be all CG or w- what's the format that the the show is going to take? Yeah, it is a live action movie. It, it is um, our our goal is literally to make a ninety minute Star Trek movie that would not look out of place in a movie theater. Um, if if, if you, you know if you saw this and didn't you didn't know better, you would say, when does CBS announce this? That's what <laughs> that's what we're looking for. Um, and that's why we're bringing so many top notch people on. Um, and you just don't want to. And, and if you're going to do that, and if that's going to be your goal, then you cannot cheat in any area. Um, I was recently on Star Trek Renegades, um, yeah. which is a really great production. Um, you know, I think they, they set out to do a lot of great things. They had a great cast. Um, but the one place that everyone's calling them on is their Starfleet uniforms. Yeah. If you were one piece of criticism of Renegades, it's the uniforms. Right. And um, and it really makes your, it impacts your entire production. Um, so we can't give that away. And there are a lot of great people, believe me, a lot of great people on Renegade. I'm very fortunate that a lot of them are going to come work for us. But we can't let up in any any specific area of our production. So um, so costume, makeup, you know. It, it's so all... here, here's, the, here's the big question for you. Funding. How are you guys coming up with the money to make the, the movie? Well, I have committed $50,000 of my own hard-earned cash to start it off. And uh, because this is a dream project for me, I literally wrote my first Garth story 20 years ago. Wow. Um, and I, <laughs> right on. And I still have have the, that that I still have that story and it's in my little Axnar folder and I will not look at it because it's so goddamn awful. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think I have one of those too. It's okay. We all do that. I have one of those. It's called my first marriage certificate. <laughs> oh, dude! Uh, so I got we all, it. yes, we all, we're all young and stupid at some point. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, um, uh, yeah. So, I, I mean, it has been a dream project, and um, you know, I, I, I have this opportunity um, to do something that I've dreamed about for a while, and I'm really looking to get into the the film industry. And and me and and Christian, my my friend, um, uh, have a uh, have decided that we're you know we're going to make this a, a showpiece for um, for us in the industry we want pe- we literally want someone to take that DVD and put it on uh, on JJ's desk or on Spielberg's desk or so and or someone at Paramount or someone at CBS and say you've got to freaking watch this it is unbelievable yeah. and that forces someone to pick up the phone well I a question that I have with everything one of the things that people don't talk about is and, and you're talking about the, the production of it how are you dealing with the music Have have you gotten anybody for that? Because that can often, we've often on our show talked about the first time the Reliant and the Enterprise battle in Star Trek II, how the music totally made that scene unforgettable. Right. So um, when we had our first article last December in Mm -hmm. TrekMovie.com, I got contacted by a composer named Alec Bornstein. And uh, he sends me an email and says, hi, my name is Alec Bornstein. Um, I'm a composer and I want to do the score for Axnar. And um, I was like, okay, well, why don't you send me a couple themes that you know that you cook up and uh, let me see how good you are so um, he, he literally spends about two weeks and we meet at, we meet at a um, at a restaurant and he gives me earphones and he says okay and and, he, and I listened to the four tracks he did and I was blown away I was like oh my <laughs> god this kid is amazing and and I am a fan of movie soundtracks I've been collecting movie soundtracks since high school um, and, and uh, me and all my buddies were all big soundtrack fans and, and you know we all so we all compare notes this kid was good. And then he goes, oh, yeah, well, my first job in L.A. was um, working for Bear McCreary, who, of course, uh, did oh, oh, oh. I was like, oh. He goes, and, and then I left Bear and I went to work for Hans Zimmer. I'm like, oh, crap, really? Wow. So, um, I may have to excuse myself in a moment. Good Lord. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and I don't know that I, I unfortunately, it's not, I, I haven't put it on the public action our site, but I will give you guys um, access to the music you listen to it. So he wrote um, four pieces. Um, he wrote a theme. He wrote a, a piece for the opening scene. And uh, he wrote a piece for the Klingon for Karn, and then he wrote a, a music for this specific scene, one of the really important scenes at the end of the, the movie. And um, and that one track is literally one of the best soundtrack tracks I've ever heard in my entire life. I, I put it in my top five, and wow. it is that good and that powerful because it's a really emotional scene for Garth, and he nails it. And um, and then he sent me another. He said, "Oh, I, I'm sending you another track. It's it's um it's April's theme." I said, "Oh, okay, that's interesting." So he sends it to me, and you don't see April much, and you really there's there's, there's three scenes with April in this movie. One's a big scene, and and there's two other scenes. But so he says it to me, and I'm listening to the music, and I go, um, okay, that doesn't do it for me. That's April's theme, and and I, so I call him up and say, you know, that's a miss in my book. What? And he goes, no, 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 
it's not April's theme. He said, it's for this specific scene. And there's a scene in the bar where April's talking to Garth and uh, mentor to mentor to mentee, if you will. And so I go, oh, okay, let me listen to it again. So I reread the script and then I listened to it and I was like, oh, damn, that is wow. good. <laughs> you know, because it made it. So his context made the just difference. What you're, just what you talked about with the, the music for the Battle of the Matara Nebula, same thing. You, when you listen to the Battle of the Matara Nebula, you cannot help but recreate that entire scene in your mind. Yep. You know exactly what's happening on every uh-huh. beat music. And that's the way Alex Bornstein is. So I think, you know, all the fan film always regurgitate um, Star Trek mu- music for the most part. I know Farragut has a new composer, which is really good. But for the most part, everyone's using uh, TOS music for the most part. Or the newer films are using the new music. Well, so we've got a composer who's composing the whole thing from scratch. And That's amazing. And That's excellent. Really exciting. Now to get well, to get geeky on you, uh, will there be any Matt Decker or Christopher Pike in this? So um, no, that's an interesting question. Um, we didn't even think about Decker, to be honest with you. Um, we did think about Pike, but the timeline doesn't work. He's too young at this point, um, uh, based on when he was born and, and everything. We, uh, because also he's pretty young when you see him in the cage, so yeah. he couldn't be a he couldn't be a um, yeah, because uh, he would have been like ten years old. Yeah, it just yeah. it just didn't work. So, um, we, and we don't want to, you know, as it is, we have to make the, we're fudging a little on the peace conference in that the peace conference is technically, depending on what happens at the end, meaning we all also know that uh, James Kirk was awarded the Palm Leaf of Axanar for his work on the peace mission of Axanar when he was a new fledged cadet aboard the Republic. Um, and so we're, we are considering a little cameo there at the end um, for, for, for James Kirk, just like a really one, one little snippet where you just see him. Um, and but in order to do that, we have to make the peace conference literally five years after. The ba- oh, I mean the that's that's not difficult if you look at the the Paris peace talks or the Pamela John or things like that. Absolutely, no question about it. No question about it. So um, we try. So we try and say that um, the the one role that I haven't cast yet that we're trying to cast, um, and I just need to get in contact with his agent um, is I really really want to get Ferran to here to reprise his role of Rafa. <laughs> Because we live in the... You have no idea what you have just done. Terry and I are both sweating <laughs> right now. <laughs> See, okay, Terry, you know, you, you can tell, but I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm painfully hetero, but if I was trapped in a prison cell with Fahan Tahir, I don't think I'd complain. <laughs> you have no idea. I. You, oh, my God. You just made fans out of both of them. <laughs> That's, well, we haven't done it yet. I, he is in the script, and um, it, it's really... Well, first of all, to, for the viewers out there, you know, um, the Kelvin and Rabau and, and George Kirk, that is all canon up until the moment that the Narada comes through the, the wormhole. Right. Mm-hmm. right. That is all canon. Right. The, the thing yeah. that changes, the alternate universe branches off at that point of the incursion of the Narada. Right. Um, so so in the Prime universe, what okay. happens? This is the geekiest conversation. I love I'm, this. I'm in heaven right now. This is awesome. Okay. <laughs> um, I, and I love the fact that there's a female who can talk about this on, on the same level because oh, so many of the times it's just me and my boy, you know, my boy. Oh, oh, no. <laughs> I, I yeah. say that in the most heterosexual way. My boy Friends, right? You know, <laughs> old boys sitting around being little geeks talking about Star Trek like we did when we were in high school. Um, it, it, so anyway, I enjoy the fact that there's a, a female that appreciates this as much as, as as I do. But um, so anyway, being that we exist in the prime um, timeline, what happened to Rabau? Well, I'll tell you what happened to Rabau. He's one of those badass, right? Oh yeah, he. Is. Oh right on. Or you know, Garth oh, gets yeah, picked, who his captains are, to command the four squadrons at the Battle of Axanar. And so who's he going to pick? Well, he picks Rabau because he's one of his good friends in Axar and he's a badass and he picks um, another you know he picks Sam Travis that's the character for J.G. Herschler who is another badass and there's an Andorian in there which we have not had, you. but there's awesome because hey listen the Andorians are in Starfleet they're just not on you know there's no integration of ships yet we, we know but hey they're, they've got their ships gotta so, start somewhere gotta start somewhere um, and then there's an and, and then there's uh, the role that was going to be Pike we have to find out a diff- figure a different captain for that um, and then there's another Captain, and that's um, a female, which hopefully is going to be portrayed by Kate Vernon from Battlestar Galactica. Oh my wow. God! And that's um, a character. We, uh, her name is Sonia Alexander, and uh, and she's there just because she's a badass. She's just a bigger badass than all the boys. Um, Couldn't be Captain Shran, could it? Uh, no, we're not going there. That's <laughs> that's a bridge too far. Um, but uh, but there is a little tie in the, uh, the uh, as far as the ship, the Andorian ship name goes. But um, oh. uh, yeah, so that's kind of it. That's kind of the so that's the amazing the cast of character we've laid out. I'll, I, I just want to take a moment and, and go back to you had mentioned that, that Richard Hatch is going to be playing a Klingon. I smiled so wide because, wow, 
I, I can't wait to see him uh, as a Klingon. Wow. Now, I, I read I, I read through the column that you were talking about, which is now um, wow, almost a year old, which was the TrekMovie.com article or column. And I noticed that you commented on the bottom you were answering. A lot of people had some great questions. Uh, and your answers to one of them was that you um, opined on how the Klingons will look in your production. Will they have ridges or not? So um, that is a great question. And it was a subject today. We were lucky enough um, to add to our our uh, crew, um, Jeff Lu- uh, uh, Lewis, who was the uh, makeup artist on Star Trek Enterprise. And, wow. uh, and that started out because we wow. were talking about we need ears for Gary Graham to be Saval. Um, I was talking with uh, Tim Vitito, um, who did the makeup on Renegades, did an outstanding job. And we're like, yeah, yeah, we need to get that, get a wig. I said, well, why don't we try and find out if you know who did the makeup in Enterprise? And I, li- and a half hour of research on the internet, I got a phone number. I called him up. He picked up the phone. I'm like, hey, my name's Alec Peters, and I'm doing Axanar. And, and I tell him about it, and he's like, yeah, I'll help you out. Let me see if I can find those molds and let me see if I have any of those wigs left. And so um, that was great. And he's going to help us um, also design the Klingon. And um, oh. and so um, I then talked to Christian, our director, and um, he and I have had many conversations about this. And uh, I, I mean, I am uh, very familiar with, you know, the the, the uh, uh, Star Trek Enterprise episodes, Divergence and Affliction, where we are, mm-hmm. we are told the story of why there are, are human looking Klingons. And that is canon. And I know a lot of people are like, I I don't consider Enterprise canon. Well, tough. <laughs> it's canon. That's it's canon. the story. You don't like it? Go play in your old sandbox, but in the canon sandbox, that's, that's canon. And, Season uh, four was so strong. How can they not consider it canon? I know. I, yeah. I know. And as much as I have issues with so much of Enterprise, I don't have issues with season four. Um, I, I really I appreciated Manny Cotto uh, uh, so much, what he brought to that show. So um, so we know that there are smooth heads and there are rich heads. Um, we're not sure what you're going to see. I Honestly, we haven't made a decision yet. You will see rich heads. We're not sure what they're going to look like. Um, I think we, uh, Christian and I, both have an affinity for the Klingons in the motion picture. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we both want to stay away from the Worf, Garon, Duras, Crabhead look. Um, but I also have a, um, a, a huge appreciation for the, the work that um, Neville Page did on Star Trek Into Darkness for his Klingons. Um, and if you check out... So, something more along the lines of, of King from um, what I believe that was uh, Star Trek Six. Oh, okay, Chang. Well, Ch- Chang. So Chang. Excuse me. Chang is like <laughs> Chang is one step away from being human, right? I mean, he's got. Yeah. <laughs> that was basically Christopher Plummer saying, "I don't want a prosthetic. Give me." <laughs> give me. Um, lo- and I love Christopher Plummer. Um, but so so there's right. Our Klingons are going to fall somewhere between uh, Christopher Plummer's Chang and TNP. I-, I think that's the range. And on either okay. side of that range, you have human-looking Klingons from TOS and and the TNG looking DS9 looking Klingons that we see. So that's our range, somewhere in there. And um, if you look, go to Neville Page, it's just Google Neville Page and, and look at his uh, his site, and, and he's got um, all this great uh, Star Trek. Uh, he, he's yeah, got he's all- one of the uh, judges on Face Off. Oh, is he? Yes. Oh, very cool. Okay. Okay, I yeah, know who he is. Yeah, now. he's the bald-headed judge on Face Off. Oh, cool. Okay. I haven't watched enough of it, but oh, if, you yeah, go his, phenomenal. if you go to his website, he has all his concept work for the Klingon, and a lot of it is really interesting, and, and you know, I, I really kind of respect the fact that they've gone through this effort and look, you know, look at all these different looks. So with all this in mind, we're, we're trying to figure out a look for our Klingon um, because, again, we don't want to cover ground that has been covered already. Um, as much as I love Phase 2 or, uh, uh, you know, there are so many and there's so many, I don't I'm not off is the wrong word, but there's so many other, Im, you know, imitators or so many other people trying to do uh, what Phase 2 has done for 10 years. You know, now you've got Star Trek Continues, which is a good product. You have Star Trek Farragut, a space starship Farragut, which is a Right. wonderful product right. um, and they all vary in, in from you know in the level of fan film there are but they're all fan films and, and they're all passionate projects but they're all covering ground that's been covered already um, we, we're, we stay away from the F word uh, fan film <laughs> And um, <laughs> unofficial production. Yeah, unofficial yeah, production. yeah. We call ourselves an independent, a, web, an independent feature. Um, right. And so, if we're going to do that, then we have to reinvent. We have to create our own world, and it needs to. You need to know you're in Star Trek, but you, you're not going to say, think, look, and say, oh, those are Phase Two sets, or those are the costumes from TOS. Or we want a whole new look. And uh, for example, um, I know Star Trek continues shot in three four. Uh, they, they, you know, the, the aspect ratio. So just like it was on TV in the '60s. 
see. Um, mm-hmm. Well, that's cute. Um, but who watches TV like? No one watches anything like that anymore. That's not a True. ratio that's supported by anything we watch. Uh, whether it's our smartphone or our iPad or TV, I, I, hey, that's what we're watching. I'm watching in these big movie formats these days. So mm-hmm. we're not shooting. We're not going to use the lighting. We're not going to use the, the, the way it's shot. It's going to look like a, a, you know, a modern feature. So in that aspect, you look more towards, uh, you know, what JJ has done um, but, without the lens flares. <laughs> <laughs> a question I have for you, and, and this is probably a, a, a basic question. So people like Gary Graham and Tony Todd and JG Hertz, oh man, I'm just getting moist thinking about the, all those names. Um, are they volunteering their time? No, we actually pay them. Um, uh, to get actors of that quality, you generally have to pay them. Um, and um, But, you know, we did our budget and um, uh, I know Renegades paid their actors, um, you know, uh, and uh, yeah, you, you just negotiate. You come up with what your price is, what you can afford, what fits into your budget, and mm-hmm. that's what you, um, you you budget for that. And, and, a lot, uh, and a lot of these actors love the production so much and love the idea so much that they're willing to work for that, right? I mean, not to say that they're all, uh, dying to work for that. That's not what I'm saying, but that they're willing to negotiate with you because you know them, they're comfortable with your product, things like that. Right. Um, yes. I mean, I think you're, uh, um, we've been lucky in that and get, I mean, Richard started it off and once you get one, it's a lot easier to get to the next and the right. next. Right. Um, we are, um, you know, could they, Richard would do it for free, right? But, um, you know, once you start, you decide to pay an actor, you know, um, then you, you basically have to treat everyone the same. There's actually a, a most favored nations clause that you can put in these contracts right. to say, hey, this is what we, you know, everyone's going to get who's of this specific level is getting paid the same. Um, and so, um, so we, we, that's what we do. And, um, uh, but they're, they're really, they're actors. They want to work, right? Right. That's what they want to do. They want to work. And if they're, and, and if you're going to pay them, um, they'll work. And if the, you know, is the production quality, they want to know that, right? They don't want to appear in a, you know, a, in a half ass fan film. Um, mm-hmm. They want to appear in, so, yeah, look at what George Takai and Walter Koenig did years ago in, in Phase 2. I mean, that Phase 2, World Enough in Time with George Takei, that's the best damn fan film that the, anyone's ever put out. Um, hands down. Yeah. That is well written because Mark Zickry is a Hollywood writer. It is well produced. It's well shot. It looks great. It's moving. I mean, even Joss Whedon said he watched World Enough in Time while he, in his kitchen one day and was crying at the end. I mean, uh, you know, there's there's a certain am, uh, amount of, of gravitas to that film. Um, and once you produce something like that, then it's a lot easier to get people to come in and, and play in your sandbox. Um, David Gerald is now one of the producers on Star Trek Phase 2. And, Phase 2. And, yeah, and he's, um, uh, at full disclosure, as am I, I, I mean, I'm working with David on Star Trek Phase 2, and David's um, our story a story consultant on, on Axnar. Um, so whether it's an actor, it, whether it's someone like David who so fundamentally loves Star Trek, or it's an actor who's a working actor who wants a great role, um, you can find those people. I, heck, I've got actresses fighting over the role of Korax, which is the female lead in uh, in uh, in Axnar. I mean, they all read in like, I want that role. Um, so, I mean, I've got half a dozen really good female actresses reading for that role. So it's very good. good for fun. those that haven't taken a look, I just have to say, the Hermes is a sexy little ship. <laughs> I was going to ask about, about the ships. Um, what class is the Hermes and the Ares? So um, we started out by designing the Ares. And um, the Ares, and, and, and uh, we designed the Ares, gosh, a year, and a, you know, a year and a half ago. Um, and, and it takes cues from the Centaur from DS9. I always liked the underslung um, nacelles uh, on a ship. Um, heck, when I was drawing ships back in high school, I was drawing ships with underslung nacelles. Um, and so I, I basically said, well, listen, it's going to be smaller than a Constitution, and it's it's a it's a purpose-built warship. So what does that have? And we, it's going to have lots of torpedo tubes and lots of phasers, and and it's and it's not going to have any luxuries, and it's a it's you know it's a warship. And that's and we drew, we came up with the Ares, and we're, you know, and Tobias Richter, who does all the effects on uh, Star Trek Phase Two, designed uh, drew it up, and it came out great. We were happy. And then we said, okay, what's the rest of Starfleet look like? And we looked at, um, and I said, well, let's look at all those ships in JJ Pro in JJ Star Trek and um, let's assume that these ships are all older ships because the Enterprise is brand new and when, when you know when that takes place um, which I think I think JJ Trek takes place in 2254 I think um, and uh, so all those sh- other ships you see which are you can see obviously if you have the Blu-ray or you get the art of Star Trek book um, we said well let's go with these designs let's and let's take riff, start riffing on this and so basically Tobias converted them all put on um, more TOS style nacelles kind of like the Ares has um, retextured them and and we change them so some of those designs are, are uh, kind of uh, take their inspiration from the ships we see in, in JJ Trek um, because 
we're also assuming that, well, some of these ships are probably were around at the time of the Kelvin. So that's where it comes. So we said, listen, you have different classes. You have a destroyer, you have a cruiser, you have a heavy cruiser, and you have a carrier. And so our one nacelle ship is a, is a, is a uh, destroyer. you got a, car- a cruiser with two nacelles. you got a heavy cruiser with two nacelles and a secondary hull. And you have a carrier with two nacelles and two secondary hulls. So it's got a lot of shuttles on it. Um, and that's kind of the design philosophy for it, for, for the fleet. Um, and then we went to the Klingon fleet and um, we said, well, in Axonar, the Constitution class and the Klingon V7 are both the dreadnoughts of their time. And both sides are racing who can get out the dreadnought first. So, and that's a real important story element in Axonar. So we said, okay, if that's what the Klingons are doing, what does the D6 look like? And um, Tobias came up with a design for the D6 and then we are fortunate enough to have the digital files for the uh, for all the Klingon ships you saw in Enterprise. And so all those ships, you know, you'll see uh, a D4, a D5, an early bird of prey, and the Raptor. You'll see all those ships in the Klingon fleet as well. Just somebody get Mike the smelling salts. <laughs> <laughs> I am pleased. I am pleased. <laughs> I am pleased. Uh, one of the ships looks like it's a, a riff of a, of a Miranda. Kind of, it has kind of some design elements from it. Um, so, is that one of the ships that you uh, that you had mentioned that you kind of sort of rifted on to try to see how they would evolve yeah. into what we know? Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think that's what we call the Magellan class here. Um, uh, yeah, it's a pretty ship. Yeah, and that's basically it. We, you know, you'll see that um, all the ships. Um, have a carrier, have a hangar deck, um, and all the ships had a torpedo launcher. Those were the two things I said were kind of, you know, we, we, those needed to be essential. You know, if you're going to war, you got a hangar deck because you need, and you need to have a, a, a torpedo launcher. Um, that being said, um, you know, uh, some of them, like the heavy cruiser has, uh, and, the, and the destroyer, have roll bars um, for the torpedo launchers. Um, and uh, yeah, so we try to carry design elements through them also. It looked like there's some consistency in the way Starfleet is designing ships. Just as the Reliant, the Miranda class, looked like when you saw the refit Enterprise, the Miranda made total sense, right? Oh, smaller version, no secondary hull. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Wow. And to t- take it off the off subject for a little bit, you had mentioned that you worked for PropWorks? I started PropWorks. You, you, I was going to say, started. you founded PropWorks. I did. I did. And we did the Battlestar Galactica auction, Stargate auction, did three Star Trek auctions, Iron Man, Iron Man 2, and the Kevin Smith auction. And um, unfortunately, the business just kind of dried up. We, yeah. You know, Battlestar Galactica Galactica, those auctions were just we started, you know, it's kind of like landing on the moon. What next? <laughs> those <laughs> auctions were so great and everyone still tells me, oh, those were the best prop auctions ever. Um, and Stargate was great. Our catalogs for Stargate are amazing. But um, those auctions happened a little too long after the series was cancelled. And uh, and then we just couldn't get the properties that we wanted. And um, I finally got to meet Ridley Scott, which was an honor. And um, wow. he was an absolute gentleman. Oh. And he wanted to do an auction for Prometheus. And uh, I flew over to London and I met with him. He said, "Let's do it." And Buck said, "No." And that, oh. that was kind of like the nail in the coffin. And I said, "Okay, I can't do this anymore. There's yeah. no business here." So um, I'm now working full time in Axonar. So I, the good news is, it's allowed me to work full time in Axonar. Yeah, that's fun, though. Good for you. That's Congratulations good. on uh, at least being able to work on Axonar. It's an amazing uh, project. I can't the, the amount of work that you, you must be trying to wrangle or corral is a better word. Um, must be amazing just with everything that you've got going on here. Um, when now everything's kind of in, in pre-production right now, when is your, I don't want to pin you down or anything, but when are you looking at going into production or right, hoping yeah. to? Yeah. So I'll first, first I want to say everyone, please look us up on Facebook, Star Trek yep. X and R. A-X-A-X-A-X-A. And uh, for our listeners, all of those links will be in the show notes. So you can they just will. go to the GNT show.com and underneath where you'll be listening to us, you can click on all the links that we are going to mention. So oh, thank you. And uh, next week, I think we'll be launching our website, Star Trek uh, And, uh, and we're, we are working on having a full convention schedule for next year. Um, uh, so hopefully we'll be at a show near you. Um, so Very as far cool. as production goes, we, our first project is to do our Kickstarter video, um, which I will, uh, tell which is going to be really, I think it's going to blow people away. Um, we, we kind of looked at the successful, two successful Kickstarters that have happened now is Star Trek Renegade did a very successful Kickstarter followed up by a successful Indiegogo campaign. Right. Um, and then, uh, Star Trek continues to just finished theirs and they did a very, they did a successful, um, uh, campaign. And if, when you look at the two, you're trying to figure out who did what well. Um, you know, the thing that Renegades did great was they got Walter and Tim to do that video and they have a trailer. Right. right? And mm-hmm. so it's instant credibility. You, you right. know what you're getting. Um, and, and so, um, uh, so that was good. I was like, okay, that's really good. And then I looked at the perks that they did 
did, and, and they and they did they good perks. So Lucas Star Trek continues. They did really well on the marketing front. Their perks were kind of weak. But uh, yeah, I would I would have to agree. Renegade's perks seemed better than uh, continues. But the <laughs> one thing, and this is just coming from a consumer side of things, folks, is the one thing that continues had was um, this almost um, uh, how do I uh, of such a fervent belief in in connecting and making it sure that it stayed so close to TOS and its original um, ideas and its script. So, and it also came out, and forgive me if I'm wrong, didn't it also come out with a, like a self-funded um, episode burst and then yeah. it went? Yep. The episode was their trailer. Right. <laughs> and, and that's why I said their trailer. And then that trailer is what made me believe these people, they can do it. They right. they can do it. And that's the di- and that was the difference. So where Renegades had the credibility, but no material up front, the, the, the Continues had not a lot of, of big names up front, but a lot of um, credibility built into the fact that they already had like a sample of the finished product. Both worked very, very well, but for very different reasons. Right. I, I, I And I agree with you there. And so taking cues from that, um, we've already crafted our Kickstarter with all the perks. And I will tell you that our perks are better than anyone's. Better than anyone's. <laughs> um, and, and, and that was really important. And um, a few more levels also serve so people who, you know, it's just kind of ridiculous. We, we just said, let's do 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 50, like lots of levels and just keep pushing people up. Like with like, oh, you get this, you know, just keep giving people stuff. Um, Because, you know, looking at the Renegades Kickstarter, it was like, I get what? You know, that's, yeah, come on. Give me, so give me something really good. And, um, and so I looked at Renegades, so I thought I did a good job on that and I made it even better. But, so we need to do a Kickstarter video and um, we are working on one. I can say that the idea we came up for our Kickstarter video has blown people away. It will be <laughs> unlike anything you've ever seen in Star Trek and in a way you aren't thinking of right now and um, we're totally excited about it I'm writing the script for it right now uh, we'll be shooting it in January probably and um, and then releasing it um, our Kickstarter will most likely start in March and um, it may start in February we're not sure we know people are broke from Christmas so we want to be careful with that um, <laughs> but uh, it is just we are so excited about our, our our video it is literally a production into itself and um, uh, it will it will blow people it's going to be fun to do it's going to be a blast to do and uh, when we do it, you will uh, we'll make sure you, that you guys uh, get it before anyone. Awesome. That's fantastic. We're, we're, we're so very excited. Any, Nick, did I hear you? No? Okay. No, I was on mute. Oh, okay. Um, uh, well, a, a related question to the Kickstarter. Uh, what kind of goal are you, are you going to be shooting for? Um, well, you know, there's the goal you put on your Kickstarter so you get the money, mm-hmm. um, which will probably be something, you know, reasonable, like a, 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 a 100000 is what Star Trek Continues went for. So I think depending on how well received, our Kickstarter video is when we release it. Um, I, that's probably a reasonable a- estimate. It, it, um, right now, the budget's 150000 So if we raise 100 including the money that I'm putting up, then we can... And you can do stretch goals? And then we're going to do stretch goals. Um, and, uh, I, I mean, ideally, we'd like to raise Renegade-type money for, for our production. I mean, Renegade totally raised 300000 um, mm-hmm. And I think wow. for a feature, you know, if we could raise two, I'd be happy. If we could raise more than that, we would be, well, I mean, just doing, um, you know, even better than what we're doing. Um, so that's... Well, We'll be, we'll be de- definitely we'll be uh, supporting and, and talking about your project as as things develop for sure. So. Yeah, and please have everyone like our Facebook page and uh, come to our website. Our website is going to be really um, a lot of fun. One of the things we have on our website um, is our Geek FAQ because um, <laughs> in, in addition to the FAQ, just the questions that people want, how do I donate money and how do I help out and that stuff, um, there's the Geek FAQ, which is, um, for example, um, the questions we get from geeks all the time, the same questions, which are, why does it... Why why does the Aries have a deflector that looks like it's from TMP and not from before TOS? Okay. I'm just answering that question. I mean, it's, it's a good question. I'm a geek. I get it. So, But I've answered it so many times, we're just putting in our FAQ. <laughs> That's the definition of an FAQ. And, um, you know, and other questions uh, like that. And, and about, uh-huh. uh, we, So there is literally a geek FAQ um, for all of you nitpickers out there to nitpick about um, uh, Star Trek Exonar. We'll be going over it with a fine tooth comb. <laughs> Probably sending you a few that you'll have to add. <laughs> yeah, let me warn you about our audience. 
<laughs> yeah. Oh, listen, I've been a Star Trek fan long, probably longer than any of you. Uh, cause I'm, well, I'm I don't know about that. So, well, I don't you, know about that. <laughs> you actually watched Star Trek TOS live on TV when it first premiered on NBC? Uh, I have to say I was I was four and it was season three. Okay. Well, that's not bad. You're close. I actually <laughs> literally remember the teaser, the little teaser of the Star Trek written in the side of a mountain saying, coming this fall, Star Trek. <laughs> And, oh my. and season three, when they moved Star Trek 10 o'clock on Friday night, uh, was past my bedtime. Yeah. My mom would put me to bed at eight, wake me up at 10, let me watch Star Trek and put me to bed. That's awesome. <laughs> That's a mother who's going to heaven. No kidding. No kidding. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, well, thank you. Oh, Got to tie things up here. But um, we, we really do want to say thank you so very much for joining us. And for everybody that is, this is Alec Peters. He, shall we call you executive producer? Um, this producer's fine. Creator, you can call me the creator of Star Trek X-Star. Uh, I've got, I'm, unfortunately, I wear a lot of titles. <laughs> And He's you know, the one DJ is looking for. I mean, you know, I listen, I played Garth. I wrote it. Now I have a co-writer. I'm the producer. You know, it, after a while, you know, you get a little, it, it gets ridiculous. So just say creator. Hey, everybody, this is Alec Peters. He's he's the uh, Star Trek Axonar guru. Uh-huh. Uh, and uh, we want to say thank you very much for joining us on this supplemental log of the GNT show. You um, can find his, you can find all of the Star Trek Axonar stuff on their Facebook page. Their uh, website's coming soon, Correct. All right. Next, hopefully next week. Okay. When we get that, we'll actually kind of go back and add it to our website under the show notes. So if you're listening to this a couple of weeks after we recorded it, which is actually November 15th or 13th, um, hopefully the new website, the link will be at the GNT show, uh, dot com show note. Um, Mike, you got any other questions? I can't think of anything else right now. It's been a pleasure sitting down and talking with you and, and getting a uh, and I, a better idea of, of what this project is. And, and the more I find out, the more I want to see it. <laughs> I'm very excited. It involves a lot of people that we absolutely adore on both sides of the camera. And um, it's it's wonderful to hear that more story, Star Trek stories are coming our way. So again, thank you, Alec, for joining us. Hey, thank you for having me. And in the, in the future, I, if we can, my job in uniform is I'm a military historian. So if we can get you on, if you want to talk military history, sometime. Oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> twist my arm. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, oh, I'm the, okay. I'm the uh, non-commissioned officer in charge of a history detachment, so. Fantastic. Wow, that's fascinating. Yeah, Isn't well, that like the coolest job? Yeah, re- really? Yeah, like, yeah. yeah. That, like that's the, what I do when I'm deployed is I go to where the action is and take it down for the Center of Military History. Very cool. Very cool. Well, again, thank you very much, and everybody, uh, this was the Star Trek uh, Axonar Supplemental Log, and uh, catch you later at the next one. This is Terry Lynn saying goodbye. Kapla! Joe Lontro. GNT Show is a busy little beaver production. Music for the GNT Show is provided by Warp 11, Grethor, Five Year Mission, and Andrew Allen's Smooth Federation. (laughs) 